Hey friend, welcome to Ask Dr. Betters. Most of the questions that are presented to me for these videos are secured from our comments section that you see right on the one that you're watching now. So submit your questions, make your comments, and hopefully we'll be able to answer them uh, as it becomes possible to do so. Someone wants to know, um, are there degrees of reward and punishment? For example, will someone be rewarded in heaven more than others, but still be saved? Likewise, will someone be in hell and not be punished as severely? In other words, are there degrees of punishment in hell just as there are degrees of reward in heaven. Now, Christians have been divided on this for years. Uh, so as I make an argument from scripture, somebody else will make an argument just the opposite. So we need to be careful not to be uh, doctrinaire about all this. We need to just broach this subject very carefully. Uh, Jesus spoke often to his disciples in parables. Parables are illustrations, whether from nature or from events that people were aware of going on around them, that have a greater point. Usually a parable has one point that Jesus is trying to make. Now, sometimes he has more than one point. Such is the case in Matthew chapter 25, where Jesus talks about the parable of the talents. <clears throat> it goes this way. It was like a man going on a journey. He called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To the one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. Now, we could stop right there and preach a whole series of messages on what that means. It means that God blesses people with talents, uh, money, resources, uh, even trials. He blesses people in different ways and he entrusts what he has given to them to be used and multiplied for his glory. So in this particular case, he's talking money. So he gave one guy five talents, he gave another two talents, and he gave another one talent. The rest of the parable is about what those recipients of these talents did with their treasure. Some of them went and invested their talents and were able to bear fruit. So the one who gave five or was given five, he went at once and traded with them and he made five talents more. So he took his five and he doubled it. So also the one who had the two talents made two talents more. So he doubled it. Uh, the one who had received one talent went and buried his master's money. He did nothing with it. Later on, he would say uh, the reason that he buried it was because he was afraid that he would fail and that the master would be angry with him. Uh, and the master really was angry with him. He says in verse 29 of Matthew 25, for to everyone who has will more be given and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. He says, cast that worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. It doesn't sound like he was too happy with the one who buried 
the one talent that God gave him. You see, God doesn't judge the one who had two talents because he didn't triple it or quadruple it. He talked about his worth to the kingdom of God because he doubled the two. The one who had the five doubled the five. The one who had the one talent buried it. Now, so you think about a woman who we might call the one with the widow's might. She has very little. She's poor. She's struggling. She can barely make ends meet. But she sacrifices what God has given her to build the kingdom of God. And you take the millionaire who's been given a lot and he gives the same proportion as the woman with the might. Let's just make it practical. The millionaire tithes his million dollars. He gives 10%. And so now his million becomes 1.1 million because he has tithed his million dollars. But that has not become a sacrifice to him at all. To him, it's, it's really nothing. It's pocket change to tithe the million dollars. But the widow who gives, who has a dollar and gives it all, she's only given a dollar, not a hundred thousand dollars, just a dollar, but she gave everything that she had. And so God commends that gift and he condemns the other because it was not at all sacrificial. I like to put it this way. God does not call us to equal giving. He calls us to equal sacrifice. So are you sacrificing for the kingdom's sake? Well, he goes on and he talks about the final judgment. And he says, um, truly, truly, I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. This is in the context of him separating the sheep or the righteous ones from the goats or the unsaved ones. The one goes on to his left hand, the left hand of judgment. One goes on to his right hand, the right hand of blessing. Now, now watch this. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, verse 31, Matthew 25, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from the other as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom of God, prepared for you from the foundation of the world. These are clearly believers. For I was hungry. You gave me no food. Uh, you, you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger. You welcomed me. I was naked. You clothed me. I was sick. You visited me. I was in prison. You came to me. Then the righteous, that's a key word there, the righteous will answer him saying, now the word righteous there is referring to Christians, those who have trusted Christ as their savior. The righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? The king will answer, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left, these are the goats. Doesn't mean greatest of all time either. These are the goats, the unsaved. Depart from me, you cursed. Into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And you did none of these things. Then he will answer them, 
Truly, I truly, I say to you, you did not do it to the least of these. Therefore, you did it not to me. These will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Friend, there is a righteous place that we will inherit, the kingdom of heaven. There is an unrighteous place that the lost will inherit. It's called hell. And he says to us who are the righteous, he says, well done, you good and faithful servants. You have been faithful over a little. Now I will make you ruler over much. What does that mean? What are we going to rule? What does it mean that we will be rulers over much? Why are some only able to be spoken of as you've accomplished a little, but I'm, not, I'm going to make you ruler over much? Heaven is the presence of God. Hell is the absence of God. There is a place of judgment. Whatever that hellfire means, it means ultimately separation from a holy God. Yes, I do believe there are degrees of punishment in hell, but they all amount to the same horrible fact. It's absence from God. It's the outer chamber. It's the outer darkness, not the inner place, the outer place, the place of darkness, the place of separation, the place of, of judgment, and the place in the presence of God well, we know the 24 elders sit close to the throne. They hear the lamb. They know the lamb. We know that there is degrees of punishment in hell. And we know there are degrees of reward in heaven. Can we prove that? All we can look at is what he tells us from his word. You have been faithful over a little. Now I will make you or cause you to rule over much. I happen to believe that there are many worlds out there that have yet to hear the gospel and that to rule means that we will have governance over those kingdoms wherever they are, whoever occupies them. Even the angels don't know this. Even the angels uh, will serve us. What does it mean? to have angels serve you. And why? Why are we being served? All of this can be interpreted very simply, but yet profoundly. There are degrees of reward awaiting us. There are degrees of punishment awaiting those who do not know Christ. Hope this helps. Hi, my name is Melissa Weisenfels, Executive Director here at Mark Inc. Ministries. Thank you so very much for your continued support of this video series. Ask Dr. Betters is not meant to be a substitute for professional counseling, but instead is designed to extract biblical principles around the questions being asked. We encourage you to seek professional counseling if needed.